I'm going to start uh, today with um, Nadine Burke Harris, who is the recipient in the human condition category. And Nadine was singled out by our jury because of the extraordinary character that she brings to her work, her desire to, her passion for children and her desire to make something better for them. She is a pediatrician and a researcher who works at the amazing nexus of trauma and poverty and the lifelong effects that children suffer from being exposed to both. So what we want to hear from Nadine about is a little bit about her work, and then I'll ask you about it after. Thank you very much, Grant, and to the Haynes Endowment, this is a tremendous honor. When I finished my residency at Stanford and um, decided to go into practice, I opened a clinic in a very underserved neighborhood of San Francisco called Bayview Hunters Point. This is a place where prior to my coming, there was only one pediatrician in practice to serve more than 10 thousand children in the community. And when I began seeing patients, I noticed a disturbing trend. Over and over again, I was being referred patient after patient for ADHD, or Attention Deficit Hyperactivity Disorder. But when I really listened to my patients, I couldn't make a diagnosis of ADHD. The stories that my patients were telling me was of exposure to such degrees of trauma that they literally did not meet the criteria for ADHD. It seemed like something else was going on. And so I threw myself into the research about how adversity affects the developing brains and bodies of children. And what I found was something striking. One day, my colleague walked into my office and he said, have you seen this? In his hand was a copy of a research study called the Adverse Childhood Experiences Study. Now, if you haven't heard of it, <laughs> this is really important because this is something that everyone should know about. This was a study done by the CDC and Kaiser and together they asked more than 17 and a half thousand adults about their histories of what they called adverse childhood experiences. These include physical, emotional, and sexual abuse, physical and emotional neglect, or growing up in a household where there was a parent who was mentally ill, substance dependent, incarcerated, where there was parental separation or divorce, or domestic violence. And for every yes, you'd get a point on your ACE score. And then what they did was they correlated these ACE scores against health outcomes. What they found was striking, two things. First, ACEs are incredibly common. 67% of their population had at least one adverse childhood experience, and 12.6% had four or more adverse childhood experiences. Now, this, this wasn't Bayview Hunters Point. This was Kaiser San Diego, a population that was 70% Caucasian, 70% college educated. But the second thing that they found was that there was a dose-response relationship between early adversity and disease and early death. The higher your dose, the worse your health outcomes. For a person with an A score of four or more, their risk of ischemic heart disease, number one killer in the United States, was double. For hepatitis, it was two and a half times. For chronic obstructive pulmonary disease, it was almost four times. And for depression, it was four and a half times times. For suicidality, it was 12 times. Now, immediately I asked myself, how does this happen? Because if we understand the mechanism, right, if we understand how something happens, then we have a tremendous opportunity to use that science to interrupt that progression. And basically how it works is this. Imagine you're walking in the forest and you see a bear. Right? Immediately, your body releases a surge of stress hormones, including adrenaline and cortisol. So your heart starts to pound, your pupils open up, your airways dilate, and you are ready 
to either fight that bear or run from the bear. Now, another thing that happens that you may not recognize is that your immune system also ramps up. Because if you're fighting a bear, you know, you may take a couple of licks, and you want your immune system primed to bring inflammation and stabilize the wound. It's actually, it's amazing, right? It's wonderful if you're in a forest and there's a bear. But the problem is what happens when the bear comes home every night. And this system is repeated over and over and over and over again. And it goes from being adaptive or life-saving to maladaptive or health damaging. Children are especially susceptible to this repeated stress activation because their brains, immune systems, and bodies are still developing. And so these, this activation leads to long-term changes in the structure and function of children's brains, immune systems, and hormonal systems that doctors are now calling toxic stress. So in 2011, I created the Center for Youth Wellness to prevent, screen, and heal the impacts of adverse childhood experiences and toxic stress. Our center is built on three pillars, clinical, research, and policy. Our clinical work is to advance the science because believe it or not, when, we did, when I discovered the science, there was not one clinical protocol, right, to tell pediatricians how they should do things differently, despite the burden of the science that shows how tremendously impactful this could be. So if we didn't have protocols, we were gonna make some protocols, right? So our clinical program creates uh, protocols and treatments for adverse childhood experiences and toxic stress. Our research program searches high and low for the best clinical interventions, and then also rigorously puts our protocols through the paces so that we can make sure we're practicing to the highest standard of medicine. And our policy work is focused on raising awareness and spreading these protocols so that we can have broad scale adoption by every pediatrician in America and beyond. From the way our society uh, treats patients in clinic, to the way they're handled in school, to the way that they're handled by our justice system, folks who have experienced ACEs are woefully underserved by our society. When we understand the impact of early adversity, we have the opportunity to create a more healthy, just, an equitable society for all of us. Thank you. So this is sobering when you hear it. What are some interventions that are promising? Where's the good news? Yeah, so first of all, Actually, I have to say, I think this is the good news because adversity has been happening since God was a boy. We know this, right? But now what we understand are the mechanisms by which this leads to long-term changes in uh, the brain and body, and so we have the opportunity for intervention. There are six things that we know make a big difference. All the science is showing us. Sleep, nutrition, exercise, mindfulness, mental health interventions, and healthy relationships. Those are the six things. And what we are looking at now is how do we put them together in the right combination and deploy them for maximum effect. So um, we don't have to think then of, you know, when we, look at, when we look at what's happening demographically and the statistics in society and so many kids growing up in, in trauma and in mm -hmm. difficult environments, um, the news for them is that there is a possibility of treatment and a possibility of attention to this? Absolutely. I believe that this science, understanding how early adversity affects our physiologic systems, is as fundamental as germ theory, right? You remember back in the day, people, you, there'd be flu in a town, and they're like, oh yeah, get some cow's blood, put it on the door, that'll stop it, right? <laughs> so we have a history in our, of our society of, 
Unfortunately, having well-intended but misguided interventions, like some of the punitive uh, school discipline and punitive uh, uh, criminal justice systems that we're seeing today, mm -hmm. and if we understand, hey, you know, putting a seven-year-old in handcuffs when he has a tantrum in school, actually, it's, it's what I call bad ACEs hygiene. When we understand, wow, that tantrum may be a sign that that child is being exposed to something and he's manifesting symptoms. Then we, un using the science, we say, we need to approach that child differently, right? Mm -hmm. And that, I think, is the great hope and the great opportunity. The one other thing that I want to add is that we know that low-income communities, and particularly low-income communities of color, experience profound doses of adversity. But the biology is the same, whether it happens in a low-income community or in a high-income community. We should all be invested in solutions, because there is no demographic, there is no zip code where ACEs are not happening. And for me, that is a profoundly positive thing, because it means this is about us, right? So you may have just answered the, the next question, which really is about how we motivate people to care. So you've identified this research, uh, and, it's, and it's profound in its implications. Uh, but we're operating in cross, uh, cultural cross currents where there's an emphasis on being punitive, on, on enforcement. So how do you communicate this more sensitive prevention-oriented message? Well, there's a couple things. Um, and communication and how we talk about this, I think, is really critically important. Every single person in this room is one degree of separation from someone who has experienced childhood adversity. And I think that when we think about it through that lens, about what we want for our families, for our children and our grandchildren, our nieces and our nephews, then we have the opportunity to bring the best of ourselves to these solutions. Fabulous. Nadine, thank you. Thank you.